If you were transported to the Americas 100,000 years ago during the Pleistocene, you would find yourself in a very different world. The weather would be colder, the air would be drier, and many of the animals would be unlike any seen today. Although, if you were extremely unlucky, you would run into an animal that at first would seem very familiar to a well-known creature today, the wolf. However, this canine isn't the kind of wolves we are familiar with. Rather, it was something arguably much more ferocious and deadly. This is the dire wolf. The existence of this mighty beast has long been known, as remains of large extinct wolves were commonly found throughout the United States, even as far back as the 1850s. Although, at that time, it wasn't clear that these fossils all belonged to the same species. Additionally, upon examination, paleontologists believe that these remains belong to an already established genus, the Canis, which includes both extinct and living species such as wolves, dogs, coyotes, and golden jackals. This led to the dire wolf originally being dubbed as the Canis primavis. However, not long after its description, it was formally renamed to Canis Dyrus, which translates to Terrible Wolf. This is also where the nickname Dire Wolf comes from, as the dire portion is a reference to the Latin word Dyrus, while the wolf part obviously comes from its status as a wolf. However, there is a slight issue with this, as in reality, it was no wolf. This shocking surprise was revealed only in 2021 when DNA analysis showed that wolves and dire wolves are in fact not closely related at all, and instead are two highly divergent lineages with their most recent common ancestor being over 5.7 million years old, leading to yet another name change with it now being referred to as a Noisian dirus. And not only are the two not related, but it was also discovered that the gray wolf is not its closest living relative with the winner of that title actually being the African Jackal. That being said, scientists did note that the dire wolf was physically more similar to grey wolves than jackals, as they both possessed similar heights, body plans, and proportions. These similarities, as it turned out, was a result of convergent evolution, which occurs when two organisms that lack a recent common ancestor end up being very similar as they independently adapt to occupy a similar ecological niche. And we know this to be the case for the dire wolf and grey wolf as they both coexisted in North America for thousands of years. Despite the two sharing numerous similarities, the dire wolf did possess certain traits and features that made it unique and even more terrifying than the grey wolf, with one of the most recognizable traits being its impressive size. Paleontologists have estimated that a normal adult would have weighed anywhere from 60 kilograms or 132 pounds to 68 kilograms or 150 pounds making them, on average, just as large as the biggest grey wolves, and some individuals were able to get even bigger, although the exact size of these larger individuals is not currently known. That being said, paleontologists have stated that the biggest adults may have had a theoretical maximum size of 110 kilograms or 243 pounds, with larger numbers than this likely being impossible due to skeletal restraints. Theoretical maximum aside, the sizes that have been confirmed still mean that the dire wolf was one of the largest canines to ever live, and if it was a wolf, it would have been considered the largest canis species ever. Yet, when it came to its impressive stature, not all dire wolves saw this glory, as there were two different subspecies, Anoisian dirus gildai and Anoisian dirus dirus, which both differed in sizes. These two subspecies each inhabited separate locations, with the Gildai being found from California to Mexico, while the Dyrus Dyrus lived in areas east of the Great Divide. The Dyrus Dyrus was the larger of the two, being 10-15% to 15 bigger, and along with being of a larger size, this subspecies also proportionally had longer limbs, which indicated to scientists that it was likely better adapted for running. The reason for these differences aren't 100% clear to scientists, but most believe that it was a result of both environmental factors and the types of prey available in each subspecies environment. Additionally, it's also speculated that their differences stem from their ages, as Dyrus Dyrus was the younger of the two subspecies, prompting the idea that as time progressed, a change in the Americas occurred that provoked the dire wolves to become larger. This was clearly bad news for everyone else, as even the smaller of the two subspecies was quite the killing machine, as it and its larger counterpart both possessed a one-of-a-kind bite 
that is considered by paleontologists to be the most advanced of any wolf-like species. This advanced biting was granted by its relatively large skull, which in life had large temporalis muscles on both sides of its head. This enabled the dire wolf to chomp down with an extreme amount of force for its size. In fact, the dire wolf actually had pound for pound or kilo for kilo, the most powerful bite of any placental mammal, being capable of biting over twice as hard as the Smilodon, a coexisting predator that could sometimes weigh four times that of the dire wolf. Along with a crazy efficient bite, the dire wolf also had unique dentition that took its bite to the next level with its molars being especially adapted for shearing flesh and its canines having the highest level of flexibility seen in any canine. This flexibility not only supported the hypothesis that it had an immense bite, but also indicated that it was well adapted for struggling around with prey once it had them in its clutches. Unfortunately for the dire wolves' prey, they most likely had to deal with well more than one hellish bite as well since the dire wolf almost certainly was a social creature that lived in packs. This is typically believed as multiple sites across the Americas contain numerous dire wolves that died at the same place and time. One of the most famous of these sites is the La Brea Tar Pits which acted as a predator trap long ago, encasing many within its sticky pits. And the sheer amount of dire wolves found at this site alone has been enough to convince many that the dire wolf did exhibit gregarious behavior. The exact size of these packs is not known, but estimates have suggested that they numbered between 12 to 30 individuals. With these kind of numbers and its size and bite, many believe the dire wolf was an expert at taking down the large megafauna that it lived with. And in recent times, this belief has actually been confirmed through isotope analysis, which revealed that its prey specifically consisted of yesterday's camel, the Pleistocene bison, the dwarf pronghorn, the western horse, giant ground sloths, and even the giant Colombian mammoth and American mastodon, although these two seem to have been more rare for the dire wolf to hunt and scavenge. To bring down these large animals, the dire wolf likely employed similar tactics seen in grey wolf packs today, by having members first spread out and then close in on a large animal which they would proceed to dispatch with their bites. Tooth breakage amongst dire wolves was exceptionally high, being much more common than in modern day canines leading to the idea that dire wolves were pretty messy killers and experienced great struggles with their giant prey, which would have been very bloody. Paleontologists also found that it didn't specialize in any single prey and rather had a fairly balanced diet, which was hypercarnivorous, meaning that more than 70% of its food was meat. Although similar to modern day wolves, it's thought that dire wolves would eat berries and other fruits when the chance arose or in order to supplement for certain nutrients that were missing from their diets. The pack structure made the dire wolf both extremely successful and tricky to challenge, as seen in the La Brea tar pits. These pits would trap herbivores, which in turn would attract all kinds of predators. Yet, fossil remains have shown that the dire wolves were by far the most common carnivore, suggesting that they were able to take over these areas and carcasses and proceed to successfully defend them from any competitors. These packs would have been led by two alphas which were paired, with the remaining members being their offspring from the current and previous years. This also means that the dire wolf practiced monogamous relationships, something seen in grey wolves as well. The pack life of the dire wolf was truly a game changer, and allowed them to expand into many different types of habitats including open plains, grasslands, arid savannas, mountains, and steppes. Along with many different types of environments, the dire wolf also reached far and wide, with remains showing that it inhabited large portions of America, various parts of Mexico, and Canada. Additionally, dire wolf remains have also even been found in China, leading to the conjecture that it crossed the Bering Strait tens of thousands of years ago. The Chinese remains in particular were dated to 40,000 years ago, however, the dire wolf may have arrived even earlier than this. This expansion is no doubt quite impressive, but the relative lack of remains outside of the Americas does suggest that they didn't have the same level of success outside their home range, with some paleontologists pointing to competitors as their reason for their lack of success. As in Eurasia, they would have faced the cave hyena which was already a well established predator that was extremely widespread, causing immense challenges for the dire wolf. And even their home base of the Americas was no walk in the park as the dire wolf coexisted with a large amount of predators including the Smilodon, American Lion, Pleistocene Grey Wolf, 
short-faced bear, Pleistocene coyote, and modern cougars. Many of these predators also hunted the same animals, creating intense competition in the environment, which actually likely played a role in the direwolf's eating habits, as studies on the bones of its prey showed that it was a voracious eater that consumed as much as possible as quickly as possible, which is likely due to the threat of potential nearby competitors. Humans too could have been obstacles for these large canines, as they both coexisted for thousands of years, with humans arriving in North America over 20,000 years ago and direwolves only perishing 9,500 years ago. Although, as of yet, no direct evidence of interactions between the two has been unearthed. Unfortunately, the direwolf seems to not have survived beyond 9,000 years ago, and its extinction has intrigued many as it seemed to have the population numbers, the size, and the bite adaptations all on its side. The direwolf was also able to live in many different climates, including tropical ones, leading to skepticism that climate change took it out. This has led to the idea that its downfall was actually caused by the disappearance of its prey, the megafauna, many of which disappeared during the Quaternary Extinction Event which has its own debates on how it occurred, ranging from human hunting to warmer temperatures. This extinction event correlates with the direwolf's disappearance, and further support for this large prey shortage is the fact that the only large wolf-like animal to survive this purge was the grey wolves, which are less carnivorous and more gracile, meaning they were likely better at supplementing their diets. This sadly means that for now, we can only enjoy these majestic creatures through our screens which of course includes Game of Thrones. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and comment, and consider subscribing if you want to see more.